So, anybody here for the first time today? One, two, three, four, five. Oh, welcome. Welcome, welcome. So let's begin in a way that we often do, which is, if you want to simply remain silent and inward, please do that, if that's the right thing for you right now. But if it might make sense, please turn to a neighbor and share your name. And one thing you're grateful for in this moment. So just take two or three minutes to do this. So, I want to begin with the three refuges. Those of you that are here for the first time might like this. This is our hymnal, page one, page, page one through 300. Well, uh, 
Anybody else? Whoops, need one? Okay. Page, this is just hymn number 300. Yep, here we go. There's more if we really need them. Okay, let me. Here we go. Oh, let me grab another one. All right. Oh, passport. Okay, good. Hey, there's an idea. <laughs> Brilliant. Have you noticed the world being a trifle unstable? So, if the world is unstable, in what might we take refuge? Oh, I know. One does need to turn on the switch. <clears throat> Everything is contingent. So in what might one take refuge? Relationships seem unstable. Moods seem unstable. Political systems seem unstable. The climate seems unstable. Where could we possibly hang our hats? And the Buddhist world for 2,500 years, 600, 2,600 years, has proposed refuge in the Buddha, and not particularly or just the historical Buddha, but Buddha meaning that which is awake, that in you and in me which is conscious right now, which is present which is so ubiquitous, we swim in it, so we don't notice that it exists. But in this moment, you could become aware that you're seeing. Then you could let your eyes close and notice that it stops. And then seeing. So that which is aware and awake is a place perhaps to take refuge. A second refuge in the Dharma, in the way things actually are, in the teachings. But what a difference when our meditation is about, about, I sound very Canadian again. What, what, what a difference when our meditation is not about changing something and trying to get into some altered state, but into recognizing this is how it is right now. This is how life is. This is this moment. This mind is happy, sad, grumpy, joyful, spacious, etc. And then finally, refuge in the Sangha, in the community that has brought us down these teachings for all these years, and uh, in this community of practice right here. So in one of the antidotes or solaces in the face of this utter impermanence that we live in is the refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. So, let's sing it. I just need to find my copy. Temperature makes a world of difference to metal strings. They too are impermanent. Sound comes into being and disappears. <clears throat> 
So please join in if you wish. I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. Namo Buddha, Namo Buddha, Namo Buddha. I take refuge in the Sangha Dharma, the way of understanding and love. Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya. Sangha, I take refuge in the Sangha. The community of mindful harmony. Namo Sangaya, Namo Sangaya, Namo Sangaya. Once more, I take refuge in the Buddha, the one who shows me the way in this life. Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya, Namo Buddhaya. I take refuge in the Dharma, the way of understanding and love. Namo Dharmaya, Namo Dharmaya. Namo Dharmaya. I take refuge in the Sangha, the community of mindful harmony. Namo Sanghaya, Namo Sanghaya, Namo Sanghaya. Dharma Sangha. So, what to do? Nothing. <laughs> Let's just sit here and watch the show. Comfortably upright, useful for posture and not increasing the pain in the body, which is plenty painful enough. The Buddha sat cross-legged because he was from a small village in India. If he'd come from Bolivia or many other places where people squat. We'd all, we'd have our squatting Buddha pictures, statues. Because this is a training of the mind and heart. It's not a physical training particularly. Eyes can be open or closed. And there's this mysterious awareness to what, to what shall I focus or upon what should I focus this awareness? There are thousands of meditation practices on the planet. This is one of the simplest and it could be seen and is seen in some circles as kind of kindergarten training. It means I've been in kindergarten almost 40 years. Mindfulness of the body. It 
intimacy with the body. Awareness and the contact of the body with the chair. Awareness meets the life in the hands. Intimate presence meets the sensations in the face, in the eyes and the forehead. And there's something that we take for granted much that we take for granted, but. And that is the fact of in breathing and out breathing. I've been present at several human deaths. And I found it really quite remarkable to first to watch that breath stop but then to sit beside the corpse and to see it breathe. The presumption of breathing so great that the mind hallucinates movement. In this case, we don't need to hallucinate it. It's actually happening. This body is still alive and it breathes in and breathes out. And the sensations in the chest and abdomen or at the nostrils of this aliveness provide a perfect vehicle for bringing awareness into the present moment. The intention to bring awareness to breathing makes obvious how little of the time awareness is actually there and how much of the time it's lost in thought or emotion. refuge in the Dharma, in the way things are, includes accepting the fact that the mind is pretty crazy, perhaps remarkably crazy. Sometimes it's so caught in liking and disliking and restlessness and sleepiness and doubting and emotions that you can hardly find the breath.
Realizing that is a great insight. So when you can, come home to your breath. It's beginning, middle and ending. It's aliveness. But returning with no violence. We live in a time when there's some very violent imagery, the war on some drugs for some people the war on cancer, the war on this. Doesn't work, and the war on your own mind fails miserably. So why not practice love? This moment is like this, this is how it is. Mind wanders wakes up, come back. It's like the puppy, come, sit, stay, come, sit, stay.
There are many strategies and practices that are taught to assist people in paying attention. One is breath counting. On the in-breath, count one. On the out-breath, two. Go to 10 if you can. Start over at one, back to one. If you get lost, or when you get lost, when you wake up, come back to one. <laughs> Another strategy is called noting. And in this we use the cognitive capacity of the mind to sort of point at the experience, rising, rising, falling, falling. Or at the nostrils, in, in, out, out. When awareness awakens to the wandering mind, wandering, wandering, returning. Or it could be more specific. Wanting, wanting, or not wanting, not wanting, or restless, agitated, worrying. It's a useful one for many people. Worry, worry, back to the breath. Sleepy, dull, back to the breath. So in this way, we put a little name on phenomena. It's not that the phenomena are their name, but the name is a useful strategy. It's like training wheels on a bike or skillful means. If your mind tends to worry, just calling it worry, worry, back to the breath. Rising, rising, falling, falling.
hearing. Noticing how every single event, whether it's in the body, in the sense door of sight or sound or taste or touch, smell, or a phenomenon in the mind, Nothing lasts, really, as long as a nanosecond. It's always springing into being and disappearing. It is a delusion that anything lasts. And this is one of the great sources of our suffering. As we come to the end of this while, sitting quietly together, what do you notice about this mind? Is it in this moment a quiet mind, empty of thoughts? Or is it a mind trying to solve some problem? Is it a mind curious about its experience? Is it a mind with aversion, disliking, fear? Is it a content mind? Is it a sleepy, dull mind? A mind with longing? To see this mind and body in this way is to recognize it is, in a certain way, quite impersonal. It does what it does.
And in a few moments, the gong will sound a couple of times. The first is to remember to wake up. And then the second is not the end of meditation, but the beginning of the next form of attention, the next form of meditation. Because there really isn't, when understood, a beginning and ending of meditation. How could there be? Because meditation is living consciously. This mind hallucinated that a group of children processed through the room. <laughs> there were noises that sounded like that. that third refuge about Sangha community. We live in a community difficult time. Many of you have heard the story that I tell about a man named Darsa in Bali. It's a longer story than this, but one part of it is this. He, uh, he lived in a village of called Penastanan, which is a 20 minute walk from Ubud, the artistic, one of the artistic core central centers of Bali. He invited us to his temple one evening for a big temple blessing. And, and the women were carrying their, you know, those fruit baskets that are six feet tall and everyone was in their finest. And, and there was gamelan music and there was gambling <laughs> And there was uh, people eating and uh, kids playing. And through the whole evening, he, he kept uh, making contact with people. He'd literally reach out and touch a hand, touch a hand, touch a hand, touch a hand. And there were hundreds, I don't know, maybe 800, 1,000 people there at least. And on the way, he walked us back through the night, through the jungle, through the path. And I asked him, how many of those people did you know? And he said, well, all of them, of course. And uh, then he said, well, no, that's not quite right. There's, there's a coterie of uh, children who are 17 to 20. <laughs> I, was, I was doing my teacher training and I was away for three years on the other side of the island. I wasn't present for their, when, at six months they put their feet on the ground and they become humans. Until then, they're not quite humans. They're, they're still between worlds. And uh, so I, I wasn't here for them. But he knew everyone in that village by name and by history. And uh, that night at walking, I, I was one of my moments of, whoa. And uh, that's how people lived for most of our time in existence not, uh, as human beings, right? For 99.96% of our time as human beings, we lived in small hunting and gathering bands. That's 0.04, which starts at Mesopotamia, quote, civilization. So this sense of tremendous isolation that we have is pretty, it's new, it's modern, it's not modernity, but it's new. And we're so busy and committed and demands on us and uh, that it's very difficult to form, and we live at distances, we live at distances from each other. So it's hard to create community. 
and we're succeeding here. This place is really, there's lots of, there's lots of friendships and relationships and marriages and divorces and we have children now and the children's program is doing very well. Um, and I want to invite you to participate, to push your limits a little bit, to realize how important, how much more important connection with each other really is than we think. Just have a thought. Part of, our, part of the breakdown of our culture is that we're so disparate and we rely on social media to get information and we silo ourselves and we don't talk across the differences anymore, less and less. So in that regard, uh, I want to invite you to, to uh, commit a little bit of your time to do some volunteer position here at PIMC. It's really needed right now. We need people in hospitality, some in housekeeping, and it's what makes this work. And it's, it's really about having a good time. It's not about hardcore. Uh, also to support the community financially, there's a, my monk's bowl from Burma 30 years ago back there. And you can also contribute online. But this is, this is a spore, this meditation community is a spore that took off from, from Asia and landed here with the support of Ruth Dennison and various other people. Ruth Dennison, my teacher of 35 years, who passed away a couple of years ago. She'd be so happy to see us here this morning. Incredibly. Maybe she is. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> um, maybe she's checking in on the... Uh, hello to those of you joining us on the internet. Maybe she's, she's watching intergalactic internet. <laughs> or inter... inter... whatever. Interlife internet. So, volunteering and... Uh, contributing to support the community. Very helpful. I think there's some spaces left on my Brighton Bush retreat, uh, though it's very close, and I th Nelson is getting very close to the 12-day retreat coming up soon. Uh, while I think of it, in case I might forget afterwards, I'm seeking a house sitter from the 22nd to the 30th for our three dogs. If that might interest you, please let me know. So, Mr. Dalton, is it still working well enough to stand and move? Let's check it. <laughs> it is. So Jim will lead us, lead you in some mindful movement and then we'll continue. Here's this, I'll move that. So let's get in touch with our feet on the floor. <coughs> our connection with the earth. We had a workshop here yesterday at Qigong where we're imagining standing like a tree with roots deep into the earth. So that's a good way to start. <coughs> Just imagining energy connections through the bottoms of the feet into the heart of the earth. And with each breath, draw energy up through those roots into your spinal column. And then on the exhale, just radiate it out into the sky. So we become bridges, we become channels connecting the earth and the sky. <clears throat> we have a function, we have a purpose among others, to be this trans transmitter, this transformer of earth energy into sky energy. So let's sink and let the arms rise and then exhale down. So we draw energy up from the earth and then return it again, our unused energy. 
just to build a rhythm and a connection. You might feel some warmth from the center of the earth. And then we'll lift and open and feel the mood expand with the arms. We loosen up the mood as we loosen up the joints. Robert was talking about noting. We can do that with Qigong. Rising, opening, closing, sinking. It doesn't always work, but some of them just fit in perfect. Rising overhead, fading away to one side, rising, fading. rising and holding for a second and then releasing out fading down crossing the wrists rising pressing opening body is a versatile tool. We can open lots of ways. Open to the side, palms up. Pull in and push. One side of the body is noting one thing, the other side noting something else. <laughs> we don't always note with the left side of the brain. Sometimes we have to do it with the whole brain. And then sinking, pulling back, rising, and sinking. Rising. The arm rises, the heel rises. Sinking. Heels in touch with the floor, the other heel rises. Sinking. So many interesting sensations. The arms and the shoulders, the legs, the breath keeps flowing. Let me get the hips into it again. Turn and gaze at the moon. Feel that stretch. Then feel the release.
lifting, pressing across, feeling the weight shift into the other leg, lifting, shifting, lifting, shifting. And this one's a little more complicated. Reach across, focus on the palm, let the other palm face the earth, draw both hands across. You have so many different sensations, so many different directions, up and down, left and right, thumbs up, palms down. So we call it cloud hands. Just picturing a cloud going across the sky with a shadow underneath, and it all comes together in one image. Breathing in, breathing out. In, cloud hands. So that's the first half. It's kind of simple, easy to do noting. I'm going to quit. <laughs> Splash in the sea. There's a lot going on here. The whole body expanding and sinking down. The whole body riding the waves. Opening the palms, coming forward, turning the wrists. This is a figure eight with the palms and the hands. Then drawing in, pausing, feeling the balance, both feet on the floor again, equal weight. Similar sensations, left to right, then stepping out, splashing in the sea, differentiating all sorts of sensations. And coming back to the center. Feeling that balance, feeling that symmetry, sinking into the knees, a little lower, making a fist, rising. The dragon rises from the sea. It's like those low pressure areas coming in from the ocean, one after the other. And then up on the toes, we'll soar with the herons and the cranes.
turning the wheel. Changing direction. And back to the center again. Peaceful, still center. Then choosing to play with the ball. One hand and one knee comes up. Lots of differentiated sensations here. And then gathering it all together, simplicity, sinking. Rising. Then coming to stillness, we can choose to Focus on one small area of the body. Just choose the one that's most obvious, the most predominant sensation. And bringing attention to one particular spot will either increase the sensation or decrease the sensation or just sort of fade away into I can't tell but we can bring the awareness into the whole standing body and do a scan step by step lower legs upper legs torso shoulders head gathering all sorts of sensations together into this standing form. And then we might change the noting to a river of sensation. The river just keeps flowing with each breath. Heat, cold, tingling, dullness, Smooth breath, rough breath, lots of different possibilities. So we just open with choiceless awareness. A standing form flowing with awareness. And then we sink. Open the hands one more time, and then come down the center. Coming back to that bridge idea, bridging heaven and earth. Standing on the earth, gathering energy from the heavens. And what are you going to do with this energy? Let's build a community. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, that's working. Technology. Hi, Sangha. Happy Sunday. I am really happy to be here on this beautiful 
gray day. And I say that without the least bit of irony. I, I, really, I really mean that. Good for the trees, good for us. And it'll be sunny again soon. Um, before I go any further, um, just I was, I've been doing my own noticing in the last few weeks. And one of the things I noticed is we have this really magnificent system of hearing devices for people who have trouble with their hearing in the back. And I just thought it would be a good idea occasionally to mention to people who have issues with their hearing that we have a sound system that allows you to put that thing on your ears and you can hear a whole lot better. So feel free to use that or, uh, or tell people you know, if you know that they're hard of hearing, that they can use that. My name is Avi Klepper and I'm community coordinator here at PIMC. My office hours are Monday through Thursday. I'm here uh, Mondays and Wednesdays from 9 to 1, and Tuesdays and Thursdays from 8 to 12. Feel free to call me, email me, come and visit me, say hi. Um, let me know if there is any way that I can help connect you to this community in terms of volunteer opportunities or activities that we're doing, or if you have ideas or suggestions about ways that you see to make this community more fulfilling for you, if you see needs that are not being addressed that you would like to spend some energy to address. I welcome your ideas and your energy and I know that Robert and the other teachers do as well. Um, it is my goal to get to know each and every one of you in the same sort of way that the, the gentleman in Robert's story knew everyone in his village. And uh, certainly there's not a thousand of you, but <laughs> having been here for a couple of months, I see how challenging it is to get to know even a hundred people. So um, I look forward to that. Um, in terms of announcements, um, David Morrison has lost, lost his reading glasses on Thursday night. He said that they have silver metal frames with darker eyepieces. I, does, does Thursday night meet down in the living room or here? In the, in the living room, okay. So we have the potluck coming after this. Um, when you chow down out there, be on the lookout for glasses. Hopefully you won't become aware of them by hearing a crunch as you sit down. So sit carefully, yeah. Did, did, did you see them, Kate? No, I'm just waiting about the day potluck. Yeah, yeah, today's potluck, yeah. Um, so if you see glasses, please give them to me or to Robert or to one of the teachers and we will make sure that David Morrison gets them. Um, we do have the potluck coming up, so by all means, go and nosh have some good food, share some community time with members of the community, and going along with that whole community thing for you folks who are here for the first time. Um, I have become aware that there are pe people who have admitted to me, who have been here for some time, who have said that it took them a long time to go down and have food after the Dharma talk or to eat at the potluck because they didn't know anybody and they felt a little intimidated and that seems kind of sad to me. So if you are feeling that way, Come and see me afterwards if you want to go. I'd be happy to set you up with what we might call a Dharma friend for the morning. Uh, somebody to chat with who can answer your questions and can give you somebody to sort of be with while you eat. It would be a shame to miss this just because you feel like it's a new place and you feel a little uncomfortable. Um, so we have Dharma consults that are going on. Jim will be doing the Dharma consults. We have spaces for three. They start at 12.10. We've got a sign-up sheet there on the table where you can just come and see, see Jim. Um, in terms of things that are coming up, oh, before we get to things that are coming up, Robert mentioned that we have need for volunteers. We have needs for volunteers in housekeeping and in hospitality. If you have felt a desire to put your energy into this community. The volunteer positions that we have, most of them do not take more than one or two hours a month. And it is a great way to get to know people and to feel connected to this community. Um, if you have an interest in doing that, please let me know. And going along with that, our volunteer coordinator, Ruth, is um, going to be Moving on to other things, we are in need of a volunteer coordinator, somebody to make sure that all of the positions are filled, 
somebody to keep all of the background things happening that help make this a place that we want to come in, to help keep it clean, to help keep it orderly, to help have things where they, where they need to be in a way that makes this a comfortable place so we can all relax. So if that speaks to you, if you'd like to explore the idea of being a volunteer coordinator for this community, please let me know. Um, so in terms of things that are coming up, um, we've got uh, this evening with Doyle, we've got the Sunday evening sit that will be here at 6.30 tomorrow. What's that? It's me, not Doyle. Oh, okay. Sleight of hand, didn't know that. Okay, got it. All right. Somebody will be here at 6.30 to do the Sunday evening sit. And then uh, tomorrow, 7.30 on Monday, Jim will be doing uh, a meditation in Beaverton. There's information on the website about that Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday morning at 9.30 is our spiritual friends group that meets here. They welcome people. You're welcome to attend. Thursday at 7.30 p.m. we have meditation with Doug. Um, we have Joanna Macy coming for a really wonderful teaching August 26th, and we've got um, two retreats with Robert, one from July 8th to July 20th at Mountain Waters up in Nelson, and then he's doing another one from July 29th to August 3rd at Brighton Bush. And you all have a good rest of the day. Thank you very much. It's, well, there were a lot, so are they not? Really? They're not? Oh. Oh, you have the ones. All right. How many Buddhist practitioners? <laughs> does it take to hand out two pages of... <laughs> it's, it's a dilemma, isn't it? <laughs> mm. Well, maybe as we do that, I'll talk. The hymnal, right, the supplement to the hymnal. Please add this to your binder. Maybe we'll end with that.
One thing I want to do today is leave enough time that I can uh, ask you if you have any questions you'd like to pose about practice, dharma. It's like maybe I'll just do that. Let me think. <clears throat> Let me just do that. If there was an opportunity to ask a question about your Dharma practice, what would you ask? One of the things that happens when I'm giving talks, I came in on Sundays and I give a talk, and I'm not sure, I'm just, you know, there's so many interesting things about the Dharma, but sometimes I get the, I get the feeling that, hmm, I wonder what people are really asking themselves. What's, what are the real questions? So this could be an opportunity to ask that and I will do my best to respond in a skillful way. So if you wish to do that, take this. This is a direct hand-me-down from the Buddha. It works. <laughs> it's a, it works like this if you speak into the top of it rather closely. It doesn't work if you're talking to the side at all. I'm going to turn it up a little bit. That should be better. What's better? So, anybody? Please. I don't have a problem with caffeine. I have a problem without it. <laughs> 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 this is a question I've been working on for a while, and last time I asked a question here, it was similar. Um, and today you said that it's a delusion to think that anything lasts forever. Huh. And I was wondering if life is lived forever. Like, does life last forever? Does life last forever? Well, clearly individual lives don't last forever. What do you think? There's something within you that feels eternal. Something within that feels eternal. Hmm. Hmm. Whoa, bright lights here. Well, I'm stumped. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> Next. <laughs> Functionally. <laughs> I have a little diagram that I use all the time. <clears throat> and I just really like it a lot. It's actually my screensaver, but it does got too many apps in front of it. Photos. Here we go. Mm, so nice. It's a little droplet. I could stand up. Little drop. You can do it in your teacup. Take your finger, get a little wet, drop. And the drop goes boink. Poof. It actually does it eight to ten times quickly. And I use this as a metaphor for myself that, that this is me. And I emerged out of the great ocean of being, just like our universe emerged out of the great ocean of being. 14.2 billion years ago, something happened and everything came out of nothing. What? It's so strange. But then this happens, and the, the issue is that this takes itself very seriously and also takes itself as very permanent. And uh, it isn't. And uh, a great deal, if not all, of our suffering arises from this problem of taking it this permanent. 
So does something endure? Well, it would seem that that out of which the universe emerged endures. Um, but it's not very personal. <laughs> In some traditions they call it God, in others they call it Spider Mother. It's, it's, it's a very mysterious thing, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced that this that I think of as me is a very temporary phenomenon. And uh, the identification with it is a serious, it's a serious interference with loving and with happiness and with freedom because there's a tremendous effort to defend this. And it's pretty unconscious and uh, pretty, pretty demanding, which of course it needed to be in order to survive. Right? The survival, uh, watching Ruth Dennison over the last 11 days of her life, she had a cataclysmic stroke. And then without any food or water, she lasted 11 days. And I watched life just holding on. It's quite remarkable how tenacious it is. So, so has that any, any help? A microphone. I had it, here it is. Coming over here, oh, coming here. Next, over there. Thank you. Um, I am a survivor of childhood abuse, and often, oh, thank you, <laughs> when I meditate, I feel sensations and emotions that are tied to those past experiences come up, yep. and I see my mind want to process and resolve them. Um, and I know that when we talked about the three great delusions, one of them was about the delusion of the self, the other was about impermanence. And I'm, I guess I'm trying to work out if what kind of relief from suffering I can find from those delusions uh, while still honoring that these things are coming up inside me and seem to want some sort of comfort. Right. Seems to me that we can be hang on, the mind is going over here, which is oh my, isn't it remarkable how difficult life is? And sometimes we land in a family where we're neglected or intruded upon in some profound ways, which create, do uh, you know what espalier trees are? They, uh, they often, well, you, if you start with a tree, an, a, a little apple sapling, or a, yeah, an apple's a good example, and you put a fence up, and then as the little, little branches grow, you tie them on this branch, and so they wind up and they make great fences. They're tortured apple trees that create uh, uh, nice walls and fences. And we all get espaliered in some ways. Our families are, are, uh, our families are flawed, our parents are flawed. And we're doing this bizarre nuclear family thing where we have two, oftentimes one person raising children. Uh, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty challenging. Um, but anyway, there's the, one can say, there is a self and I have a self, or one can say there's not a self and therefore the self doesn't exist, I don't need to pay attention to it, and both are wrong. Because that droplet exists. Your beautiful, precious, one-of-a-kind droplet exists and she has had some serious espaliering. And so, um, You're so fortunate to have been born in this culture rather than Asia because our psychology, Western psychology, uh, especially in the last 25 years or so, 
has developed strategies for healing, for, for coming to terms with and healing much of the trauma or some of the trauma. And uh, Buddhism and meditation are not enough. That we need for, for the wounds to the self that are created in our culture, we need other strategies. And those, we, you know, we often call them therapy. Um, but they, all, they, have this, they have to do with, can I borrow your hand for a minute? In my own exploration of my own traumatic issues, I've discovered that I couldn't face them on the cushion alone. I had to have literally a hand to hold when I'm feeling teary as I talk about it, that as I move toward those issues, and in my case it was mostly a neglect and abandonment, that as I, as I internally move toward opening and feeling to that, there was no way I could stay conscious without a hand. And so there's the hand, there's the, there's the healing environment of the office of the person that I would be visiting. And, and um, so I'm a, I'm a proponent of both end. There's a place for intensive retreats. Uh, there have been a few cases on retreat uh, when I've said to a person, you know, this is the wrong medicine right now. This is, this is just bringing up way too much. Or maybe, maybe spend every afternoon, go for long walks. But don't just sit and walk and sit and walk. Because that which is coming up is overwhelming of the ego. It's not capable of tolerating it. And that's not a failure for the person. Uh, and there's... Uh, pretty universally when folks have come to me in the counseling psychotherapy modality, I almost always say, well, you should meditate. <laughs> because if you, if you really want to do this, the healing, mindfulness and concentration are extraordinarily useful to be able to turn inward and stay conscious, as, especially as we move toward the unbearable. So is that helpful? Yeah. And we can become we can do the grieving that we need to do. We can do the raging that we need, and we can do the, the crying that we do. And we, and we can tolerate the desperate, uh, uh, the desperate hopelessness. Uh, because that's not fundamentally who we are. Who we, we are that which is awake. We are the Buddha. Quite a task, though. Quite a task, but the alternative of pointless consumerism and uh, all the other silly things that we do uh, isn't very satisfying. It isn't very loving. Okay. Thanks. My hand was here. Please. So just a simple question. I'm curious about uh, if you could speak about it, the role of intuition within this uh, realm of is more awareness and cautious, consciousness. Great. Thank you. So intuition, um, when, when, if, if, we're, if we're thinking about the three characteristics of existence, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and the emptiness of the self, and the self as process, um, we can reflect on it consciously. I'm, oh, this is impermanent. Oh, this is impermanent. Oh, the day passes, the morning passes. These are all uh, cognitive reflections. When we really get it, it's an intuitive understanding. It comes, it comes from outside, it comes from outside of that which we normally think we are. And also, uh, if, if one reads the biographies of some of the great teachers, um, they have deep intuitions of, I should do this, because at, at a certain point, the path always becomes completely personal. Right? The strategies that have worked for people before um, may be helpful, but often there comes an understanding of, I should, it's happened for the Buddha, actually, Siddhartha, when he, he had worked with the jhana yogis, the concentration yogis, and then he, he fasted himself almost to death. And then he had this remembrance, oh yeah, when I was a child, I had this, experience of sitting under the tree and letting my mind relax but stay awake. and So that was an intuitive uh, moment. So it, uh, 
If we think of intu intuition as coming from outside the ego, outside that, our known self, then we're totally dependent upon it for anything new. I had a poem come to me. I read a few weeks. I read a few weeks ago here, on a plane on the way home from New Orleans about saying goodbye to my wife and impermanence. And it came, up, it came up. All I did was write it down. It wasn't mine. It was. I changed a few words I didn't like. But. <laughs> Please. Hi. My name. <clears throat> excuse me. My name is Anthony. Um, I'm from Arizona. I just moved out here a couple weeks ago. Um, Thank you. This is my uh, third class here. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, I was, uh, first of all, I like that first answer that you had about um, um, my friend Chuck, that's my friend there. He asked, um, I don't remember the exact question, but you said uh, when you die, it's uh, not personal. And that's very helpful for me because um, I was having a hard time dealing with the afterlife. Is, is there an afterlife? Is there not? All that stuff. But that makes perfect sense. I never really thought about it that way. And that's, that's awesome. Um, and uh, I wanted to respond on the child, um, the lady over there, you, you had an issue with child abuse and um, it's very interesting to me. Um, I was doing a lot of therapy classes in Arizona for drugs and alcohol. I do opiates and alcohol, so um, I'm used to talking in those classes but not in settings like this. But um, one lady that uh, was in one of my classes, she um, had a similar situation and um, she, um, just the fact that she went up to class and that she, um, she expressed, you know, that deep down rooted um, pain and um, that situation that was a step for her as far as building a, a new life and a foundation of security and comfort. And um, we were all aware of that and we would all talk about it and respond uh, to each other on issues like that. And, um, and then she uh, did little things like um, she held a job and um, despite, you know, her difficulties and she would shiver and things like that, you know, expressing all that, you know, real hard, deep stuff. So. I think, um, I think it's just very beneficial and helpful uh, for me personally to go to um, classes like these. Um, I think just the breathing, the technique is excellent for whatever problems or difficulties that you are going through. And I really like um, what you said about um, as far as um, psychiatrists and stuff like that in therapy sessions. I believe that um, you can, you're not necessarily going to be like 100%, you know, full and um, you know, satisfied, but um, there's options. And um, I think that's beautiful and wonderful. And uh, I definitely think that places like these offer um, um, hope, real hope, and not just false hope. So, and I like the interaction aspect of it, so. Great, thank you. Continuing in that regard for a moment. I, I set off on my personal healing quest uh, thinking that I would heal it all and that I'd get it all together and that my personality would be without its quirks and its balliers. And it turns out it doesn't. It turns out it's really quite easy for this personality to feel abandoned and neglected, even in a loving, long-term relationship. And, even with my children, when, they're, when they don't respond over a period of time. It's so easy that the programming is, <gasps> but then clearly that programming isn't me. That's just the personality. And, but I, I have a vulnerability there, and so I have to take care of that. I have to be attentive to it. Uh, and that's also part of where one's gifts, you know, the wounded healer gift is, how we become useful in the world often is where we have a wound, then when we can grieve that and, and embrace it, then when we meet another who has a wound, we really get it. And we're not out to fix them or get them to get over it. It's more like, ah, yes, we share this. And this is our human experience. This is the human condition. Other question? Here. This is fun making my way amongst. I can bump into people. <laughs> nice beard, by the way. It's kind of long. Okay, this is to a simple question, I hope. What's a Dharma consult? A Dharma consult. Well, you see that guy over there? 
or this woman here, or where'd Gary go, that guy there? These are all teachers here at PIMC, and they have a special little room over there, previously called the vestry, and in there, there are two chairs. And if you have a question you'd like to ask and have a conversation about, that's what it is. Or, or if you sign up with Avi to see me, I have a little den over outside there, and we sit and talk about whatever we're talking about for half an hour. Yeah, yeah. That's a test, actually. So, can I hear you all this? <laughs> we do the Tibetan thing, and what is your question? <laughs> Inadequate question. <laughs> Why are you wasting my time? <laughs> Please. Cricket. A couple of weeks ago, we had a speaker, and he was talking about three things that all of us have endured, I guess, uh, and most of us, one in a larger amount than the other. One of them was abandonment, the other was betrayal, and what was the third one? I have no idea. Shame. shame. Oh, shame. Thank you. I've been trying to remember that. I could get the two, and it's a Neglect, neglect, and <laughs> neglect, and intrusion are the really huge ones that can then result in shame and anxiety and like basic trust issues. But sometimes the parents are way too close and really intrusive, and sometimes they're too far. Or sometimes it's close and then far and close. My my experience was close and far, super close, and then <laughs> gone which leads to insecure attachment. Actually, I'm watching that. I, I got to spend an evening two nights ago with my, uh, with my grandson. And the task with him again and again and again, he's 10 weeks, the task is, you're safe. You're safe. You're crying, that's okay, I'm here with you. Oh, you're happy, that's okay, I'm here with you. I'll hold you, I'll hold you till I fall asleep. Oh, you're waking up, that's okay. Oh, now you're irritated. He gets so angry. Right? Ah, the world is terrible! And then, oh, it's okay. Whew. But, but what does he need? He just needs that, that presence and good enough, as they call it, good enough parenting. Which is a good, good enough parenting means that the soothing happens often enough that the, ba that the, that the frontal co prefrontal cortex actually wires itself to compassion and that the baby learns, that we learn to, to trust the world. And, and, of course, it's imperfect. One of the purposes of community is to help us with that basic trust issue. That we stick in there with each other over weeks, months, years, maybe decades, and we discover, well, fr friendship really is healing. Hard, real friendship. Please, Larry. For those of us who really don't like suffering, does Buddhism offer any hope at some point of going beyond suffering? Is that what the Buddha attained? Hmm. They say, they, they speak of the arhat as a being who is beyond suffering, who no longer takes the self personally at all. And I don't, I don't know that I've met, I, the, the one fellow that I met who may fit that category was a Tang Pulu Saida, the man who gave me that, that bowl, actually, when I left Burma. Uh, he was, at, when I knew him, briefly, for a week, he was 82 years old, and he had come down from Rangoon to, ba not Bombay, to, he'd gone from Mandalay to Rangoon, now something else. Um, and uh, we all got up around five in the morning, he was there, there was chanting, most of which I didn't understand, uh, for an hour or so. And then very soon after that, he would sit in a chair. No, he would sit cross-legged. And the people of Rangoon would line up and would meet with him. And from then until uh, probably 11 o'clock, so for five or six hours, he would sit there and people would come in two at a time, six at a time, one at a time. People would cry and freak out and he would give them, he would counsel them basically, teaching. 
He would then pause for the one meal of the day, maybe an hour and a half, and then from then until nine o'clock at night, he would be with people coming into the room. He did that for four months straight. He didn't do anything else. That's not true. <laughs> he caught me one afternoon, it was so hot. I had my robe on and it was so hot, I took my robe off in my, in my private little space and that was the moment he came in and caught me with my robe off. <laughs> It's hard to be, uh, but he, he seemed to be a person without a self and with, with extraordinary generosity. And that was at age 82. So, but maybe, maybe more to the point, uh, I've seen some of you in this room actually, and I've seen this person over the years suffer less and less and less. So many things that used to create suffering are simply irrelevant. It's like, oh, there's that. And I watch people freak out. I, a great example, a few months ago, I was in an airport somewhere, and uh, they announced that the plane, when oh, I was sick, and they announced that the plane would be late, and then they announced that the plane would be late, and then they announced that the plane would be late, and it turned out it was about six hours, and I was not feeling well, but I had a nice place to sit, and I had my iPad, and at my breath, and uh, there was no dukkha, there was no dissatisfaction at all. Though, and, I, and I watched some of the other travelers absolutely go crazy and be, and, uh, be uh, un really nasty to the people. What purpose could it possibly serve to be angry and kind of shouting at the person at the desk who doesn't have any control over whether the aircraft is functional or not? Well, and then we got, we got on and we went out to de-ice and they de-iced and in the de-icing something happened and so we came back in again. We got on and we went out and they de-iced and the same thing happened again and we came in again and finally the flight was canceled, that's what it was. And then, but the, I, didn't have any, any, I didn't have any experience of dis dissatisfaction with it, it was, just, it was just what it was and now other things can get me, right? things happening with my kids or difficulties in my, my marriage. There's still plenty of that. But lots of things that used to be a problem aren't, and I'm sure that, raise your hand if that's true for you with this practice. Look at that, look, look around. Do you think it works? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I had, how's the time? I had road rage way back when. And I had such ridiculous road rage, this is a 25 years ago or more, my mother-in-law, bless her heart, Joan McLaughlin, passed away a few years ago. She, her brother got a great deal on uh, flight jackets, black leather jacket with for really, really nice flight jackets. So I had a black leather jacket. An effect on my psyche. And I was coming in on I-5, right to, uh, in front of the Marriott Hotel, and some guy cut me off. And I chased him in my car, and pulled up behind him, and jumped out of my car, and ran to his window, and was yelling at him and shaking my fist. When I realized, this is really stupid, he could get out of his car and pulverize me, or he could have a gun, or what would the Sunday night meditators think of this? <laughs> and that was the last time I ever did anything like that. But also the impulse to that has gone, if someone cuts me off, there might be a moment, but very brief, someone, it's like, wow, that person's hurting a lot. That's where the impulse goes now. So that's a, quite a change in, in character. Of course, it has been 25 years. I'm not claiming to be a quick learner. <laughs> I had a chiropractor some years ago, working on my head, said, you have the thickest, boniest head I've ever worked on. And I thought, that's true. <laughs> Slow to learn. So anybody else? Please, Rod. Uh, I can't.
Canadian in our midst. Yeah, I, I've been told I have a thick skull too, but maybe it comes with the country. <laughs> it's, it's true. <laughs> we Canucks. <laughs> Take those hockey pucks in the head. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they're so good at it. Um, I, I, for some reason, I had. Um, I think it's relevant to this discussion of sangha. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in what the Buddha's idea of Sangha was. I've never heard any talk of that, any connection to the Buddha and people organization. And um, Buddhism always seems to me kind of vague and unstructured. And, um, and so community is a bit of a um, vague and unstructured phenomenon. You know, in, in, when this was a church, I'm sure there was all kinds of layers of organization. And uh, so I just, uh, it, just bring this other little thing in that is in my head and synchronistically. Uh, it's a guy named A.S. Neal that ran one of the most successful schools ever called Summerhill. And he had two kind of arms to his success. Uh, he discussed in a book 25 years after the fact, and looking in back in retrospect, he said it wasn't the counseling that I think, used to think was the key to my success. The kids would come in for fireside counseling in the evenings, and he thought this was the big point. He said it was actually that they were allowed to set up their own government, and that mm -hmm. they, they were encouraged six years old of 16 years old to govern themselves and right. and completely on their own and when they had trouble they would come to a teacher and say well we're not getting this quite right how do we do this but it was theirs and he said that was the key mm -hmm. that made his school successful and uh, i just i see that i don't i'm not quite articulating the revel relevance to what's happening here in pimc but uh, anyhow I'll, I'll give that to you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Next. <laughs> well, there's lots of structure in Buddhism, lots of structure in early Buddhism, but the, the Buddha's community, um, people uh, banded together, uh, lived together, tons of rules for the Theravadan monk. There's 228 basic rules. There's many beyond that. Um, so, and then there's, uh, there's teachings for the lay community, how the lay community should, should relate to each other. And there's, uh, there's not a lot, but there's some very specific teachings uh, to uh, leadership, to kings of his time. Uh, you should provide adequate capital. If you, oh, this is a beauty I read recently. Um, there's a whole thing in the Dharma about turning the wheel of the Dharma. Uh, and there's a wheel turning king is a king who does not tolerate poverty of any kind in his kingdom. If you are successful as a king, but there is poverty, if the differential between the wealthy and the poor is too great, you are not a successful king. So there were some very specific guidances like that. Um, and in terms of governance, there's, there's all kinds of different models of governance in Buddhist communities from, from uh, very structured to very little structure. And we are still creating our participatory community governance here and that's why, as, as Avi mentioned, if you have ideas, come on in and share them and, and let's connect because the, there, isn't, there isn't a particularly... Well, I was resistant at first to any hierarchy, but then you can't have an organization without some people who are devoting more time than others and some people who take more responsibility. But our intention is to be open to whatever's here in the community. I keep being nagged or something else. I'm, I'm, I'm not ready to teach about it yet. 
but my ongoing, some of you know, my ongoing education about uh, structural racism uh, and coming out of slavery in the United States, and I'm, I'm halfway through uh, books on, you know, on, on uh, listening to uh, the new Jim Crow, mass incarceration in America, and I must say I am stunned. I am stunned with what I'm learning about the war on drugs and how it, how it has, how it has cut the legs off the African American community, and and the the way the Supreme Court has consistently supported draconian, horrendous laws. I had no idea. I feel I've kind of had my head has been so far in the sand. I can hardly believe it. So I'll be speaking about the, that when I feel a little bit more integrated with it. Uh, but uh, stop and frisk, stop and search. The the uh, the penalties for crack versus cocaine. The fact that the African American community has no greater violence than the white community, and there's no greater chance of people using quote illegal drugs, and people's lives are ruined for having one joint. And they can never get food stamps, help with housing, cannot join the military, cannot serve on a jury, cannot vote. Basically, you're out. One strike and you're out, often. Quite shocking to me, I had no idea. I, I feel like I've been living in cotton wool, actually. So, more on that as a community. I'm hoping we'll get some, some better education about that as a community. So, that was a lot to dump. Hope it wasn't too much. Um, I invite you to join me. This is one of the songs that I love and that I actually, several years ago, decided I wanted to play the guitar so that I could sh sing this with you. And this is the second time I've done so. The first time failed miserably. <laughs> so I hope that wasn't a, a predictor of this. Um, that was a while ago. Kate Wolf. So there is this, we are doing the practice of insight meditation, of insight into the nature of reality, impermanence, and so on. But why? And what's the real vehicle? And I think the real vehicle is love. That if we don't... Uh, it's Guy Armstrong, he's a teacher at Spirit Rock, who I was told recently, he's not so much talking about mindfulness now as intimacy, because mindfulness has been used in so many ways. What does it mean? And to be intimate with life, to be intimate with our own direct experience is to be present, right? And that's love. There's room for everything. And so this is a song by Kate Wolf that uh, speaks of that reality of love. Let's see how we can do with it. Kind friends all gathered round There's something I would say What brings us together here Has blessed us all today Love has made a circle That holds us all inside Strangers are as family And loneliness can't hide you must give yourself to love if love is what you are after open up your heart to the tears and the laughter and give yourself to love give yourself to love I've walked these mountains in the rain I've learned to love the wind 
I've been up before the sunrise to watch the day begin. And I always knew I'd find you, though I never did know how. Like sunshine on a cloudy day, you stand before me now. So give yourself to love, if love is what you are after. Open up your heart to the tears and the laughter and give yourself to love, give yourself to love. Oh, love is born in fire and planted like a seed. Love can't give you everything, but it'll give you what you need. Love comes when you're ready, love comes when you're afraid. It'll be your best teacher, the best friend you've ever made. So give, give yourself to love, if love is what you are after. Oh, I lost my place here. Ah, open up your heart to the tears and the laughter and give yourself to love give yourself to love let's do that again you, you must give yourself to love if love is what you are after open up your heart to the tears and the laughter and give yourself to love Give yourself to love. Not bad. We did it. Yay. Thank you, Kate Wolf. That's a bad plug. Give yourself to love. So thank you. Please, now we're going to have a the extravaganza of the children entering. I invite you to stand up, join hands. Do please come and share in some food and some connection and see you soon. See you soon gathered around the campfire of the kids. Oh good, yeah. I think, uh, can you, is it not there? Here we go. Please find a hand to hold. May I hold your hand? Thank you. Oh, you guys have been outside. That's a cold hand. So, here we are. 
It's one thing to reflect that everything is empty and it's all stardust and we come and go. It's another to feel the hand of the person beside you and realize that they are one of a kind ever, ever in the universe. Talk about precious, huh? And so part of our aspiration to treat one another kindly and equitably and lovingly, it comes out of all, all human behavior comes out of our mind, out of our ideologies and perceptions. So why not create a mind that willingly, easily thinks kind thoughts? So think, give a hand in your right a little squeeze and think of a kind thought for this person. What would it be? What would you bless them with? And the person on your left, same thing, a kind, loving thought. And then imagining sending this energy around the circle, in your right hand, out your left, all around the circle. And then out, spinning out into the world, into all the houses that surround the center. Everyone in Portland, in fact, everyone all over the planet, without exception, those who are extremely powerful and those who are powerless. Those who are being born right now and those who are dying. And let's remember our brothers and sisters of the air, the earth and the waters, Our friends who fly, who crawl, who run on hooves, who swim in the oceans and lakes, who crawl underground. We're one big living mysterious phenomenon. Hmm. And so now, time to do something a little out of the ordinary. This is Monica's last day. And Eric's not first, but tuning in. <laughs> so, Monica, we have a little present for you, which, which we'd like you to open right now. <laughs> <laughs> Monica's been with us. How long has you been with us? Um, a year and a half. A year and a half, yeah. I'm only going to ask you to say something if you want. <laughs> Oh, well, there's more wrapping. It just goes on. Maybe it's just paper. Ooh, nice. Would you like to give it, give it a ear? I'll put this so you can make it ring. Nice. One more. It's a meditation bell. <laughs> All right. So, do you want to say anything? Um. <laughs> you don't have to. I just want to thank everyone for welcoming me into this community, and I want to thank all the families that I've gotten to know over the past year that I've been here. I just felt my heart deepen and widen to be with all of you and to watch the children breathe, breathe with me and meditate with me every day has been a really fulfilling, wonderful experience. So I just want to thank you for all of that. Yay. And it's Montessori training, right? She, no, Waldorf. She's, Monica's going on to Waldorf training and uh, she's certainly suited for that. Thank you for bringing your beautiful big heart to us. Hey, Robert, can I put in a word? So there is banana cake in Monica's honor down at the potluck, so I invite all of you to come and have some banana cake. Hopefully nobody, especially Monica, is allergic to bananas. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it has gluten in it. Sorry, that's the best I could do. For so do we have young singers to do our final blessing. They're recruited already, excellent. 
Here we go. Oops. Okay, thank you. All right, so. up a little bit away from the flame. Unless your hair has been covered with flame retardant, please let us keep it well back. <laughs> Everyone in the room gets to participate in the great wish. I'm practi we're practicing patience now. It's very difficult. All right, on the usual count, we will all, everyone in the room, you have to all participate. Take a big breath. One. <laughs> Two, three, go! <sighs> Yay! Thank you to those of you joining us on the internet. Thank you, everybody, and please do come and have a cup of tea and some connections.